Good morning and thank you. Thank you, Robin. Um, despite the, uh, the Irish sounding surname, which you can tell from my, my accent, I'm not, a, I'm not from these, uh, this great, great country and it's, it's great to be here today. Um, and thank you to CITA to, for, for, um, for uh, inviting me over for what hopefully will be an interesting session. So, uh, Great Portland Estates, I've been working with, uh, with BIM for the last two or three years. Um, we've developed um, a project recently called 240 Blackfriars. Um, we're still comparatively um, early in our experience to date on, on BIM. Um, it's been quite an interesting journey and we're still continuing to learn. Um, I'll go through our sort of expect expectations uh, and what lessons we've learned from the last two, three years on these various schemes and what, what advantages, what key advantages we think it's given us. Um, so we implemented BIM on our 240 Blackfires Road project, so back in 2011. Um, we quickly used it, we, we first started using it as a, purely as a class detection tool, um, and then we learnt from there we could use it uh, for construction and also for uh, later on to look, start looking at the FM side of things, which has proved to be the biggest challenge so far. Just to give a, a brief background um, about Great Portland Estates, um, we're a FTSE 250 uh, Central London focused property investment and development company. Uh, circa sort of 80% of our property is in the West, West End. Um, this is just some of our development schemes, um, mainly centred around Oxford Circus Station, which you can see in the middle there, um, all within a few miles. And uh, we're, we're just around the back of Oxford Strip Circus in a 17 storey building. If we can't see our site from the office window, we're, we're not really interested. So. Very diverse mix of tenants, predominantly TMT and leisure and re um, retailers. Uh, development programme of around about 2 million square foot over the next five, six, seven years. Um, and a record for the reputation for delivering high quality office space. And now we're moving into sort of significant residential uh, properties in development with our scheme of Rathbone Place. These are our sort of near term schemes. Just Shire, or just over 800,000 square foot, all sort of planning or on site. And these are the remainder schemes over the next, say, to 2022, so slightly longer than five or six years, but it's sort of starting on site around that time. Just shy of two million square foot. So what is BIM? I think everyone here understands what, it, what it's all about. This is a uh, care of Google or Wikipedia. This is the, the definition, um, but to make this a bit simpler, um, to us, it's a 3D representation of a building, which we can see the design stage, uh, and we use predominantly to inform um, coordination, but also we look, say, we look to, to develop the construction um, side of things as well. And, and BIM has obviously taken a lot of uh, space in the last few years, a lot of talk about BIM. Incredibly, I was in a taxi last night from, from Dublin Airport, and the taxi driver started talking to me about BIM which wasn't quite what I was expecting and that's <laughs> half an hour drive from the airport. Um, but yeah, certainly the, the word BIM is, is very recognised. Uh, what can we use for? Obviously design coordination spoken about, construction sequencing, uh, which should result in a, a reduction in risk and construction time, and also facilities management, which is the, I think the biggest challenge we face at the moment. So this is how far we've got to as a company. Um, we've done, say, we. we we started using it purely as plastic detection, but we're always keen to, to work with our contractors to try and reduce risk on our schemes and try uh, and get a sensible risk price and, and work through our, working with our contractors in the BIM environment, which we believe it's paid dividends in reducing that risk. And we took that a bit further on 240 Blackfires, where we started looking at construction sequencing. There's quite complicated structural um, works to go at the top of the building. Uh, and depending on who you talk to, we save weeks or, or months on programme, just some design and construction on, on that part of the building. We'll touch on that a bit later. And as I, as, as I touched on earlier, we're looking at how valuable the FM side of BIM could be. Um, we haven't got very far down our journey yet. We're working with BAM, I think we're in the, build, in the uh, room today actually, on, on one of our projects at St Lawrence House, on how we can use the construction, or sorry, design the construction tool, and then move that to FM. So why have we invested, it, invested in BIM when many of our peers in the sort of private commercial sector um, aren't? 
First and foremost, I think we, we believe it's the right tool to avoid clashes on site, which seems to take up people so much time and, and cost. The complex design issues can be overcome early in the design process rather than, than late, or too late quite often. Uh, program certainty, we, we've used it as a 4D tool with our contractors. And in our view, these, these aspects should result in a, in a better design, more coordinated design, a faster program, a better managed building, which ultimately ends up as a, as a more investable product. Client leadership, um, I say, we're, probably, we're one of the few clients, I think, that actually, other than government, who, who, uh, who push to use BIM. And our recent schemes, we, we constantly push out our design teams, or, or should say encourage, to use BIM and to embrace it. Um, we do need to be clear about the objectives, and that's probably one of the, again, one of the challenges as far as setting that down. Um, there's, there's a lot of documentation around on BIM at the moment, which, which can cause confusion. And I think we need to be happy to pay for it. Um, we believe it's a cost, but a, a cost that should be saved in time and money on site. Some of our projects where we've used BIM, so 240 Black Fires, which I'll touch on later, started on site in 2012, finished uh, earlier this year. Um, our first scheme we used BIM on, um, and we <coughs> learned quite a lot on this, this scheme. Rathbone Square, uh, a new scheme just starting on site, it's been demolished, it's circa 400,000 square foot. There's multiple levels of basement, um, existing basement, which you're building on top on, of. It's, it was important to ensure that the new building and the, the old um, matched, obviously, and, and using the BIM model and using point cloud surveys, it helped us to, to ensure that was the, the case. Um, the existing basement houses 60% sort of, of, the, of the plant, and it was fairly imperative we had, had that well coordinated. There's circa, I think, 100 140 flats um, in this development, and we, we modelled each flat to make sure that the coordination is right, the construction sequencing is right, so that we don't have the usual problems on a large residential scheme where um, all sorts of clashes and, and delays occur. Hanover Square, um, just I, it's constructed over the new Crossrail site being built in Bond Street, or for, for Bond Street. Um, so Crossrail developed up to the first floor slab, so the lower part of the building you can see, and then we develop up and around there. So it's important to use, we've got, if you, we're using their BIM model, which is only for information. Um, and there's, a, there's quite a complex construction sequence we're now trying to work with Crossrail by using 4D to ensure that we can get this project to site a lot earlier than currently anticipated by, by just um, working through the logistics, how that would work. Um, so as, again, as much as a design tool, as a construction tool. So hopefully, um, early stages but with Crossrail but we're hoping to bring that project forward by 12, 12, 12 months. And then New Fetter Lane which was uh, the next project on site after, after Blackfires, both projects were done with MACE um, so we've learned um, from our experiences on, on Blackfires Road and we've taken them forward onto, onto New Fetter Lane. And two sort of fairly similar projects, the Lawrence House um, which is a congested site in Soho an Ox, uh, 78, 73 to 89 Oxford Street, which is smack bang in the middle of um, London's major retail street. Both very complicated projects uh, logistically, and again, we're using BIM to help us um, get more certainty on how the construction sequence would work. So, let's focus on 240 Blackfires. Um, so, so, it's our first BIM scheme, completed early this year. Quite complex structural uh, design. Sort of sloping facades, um, very complicated roof structure, and it was constructed in two phases. We had a first phase of um, what we called the basement box up to ground floor slab, and then we had a second phase of above ground works. And it's important to us to try and make sure those two contracts and those two elements um, obviously fitted well, and we didn't hit problems as soon as we got to site. So we did a point cloud survey, which we imported into the BIM model, um, which ironed out some pretty fundamental issues, actually, so concerning ones as well. Um, We've had a wonky lift shaft and all sorts, so uh, we, we, we got through it before we even started on site, we knew where the, the main problems were. Um, and we learned a lot from this project, so it was, it was our first BIM project, and we've taken forward the lessons learned from that onto our, our future schemes. So the timeline of Black Fires, just again, quickly touch through this, it started back in uh, 2006 as a concept, 
the sort of small 14 storey building you see to your left there. Um, we went to, the initial planning application was in 2007. We amended that in 2008 to 17 storeys. And we actually only increased the building height by one metre, um, getting three extra storeys just through clever design. We didn't use BIM at that point, um, but who's to say we had? We would, that would have made that process a lot easier and quicker. Um, so we started de demolition in 2009. Uh, it went on hold for, for obvious reasons in, around that time with the, the economy. And we restarted design um, around about the end of 2010-2011 and then we brought uh, BIM into this project and uh, sort of threw up a few challenges. Um, firstly, sort of reluctance to the design team or some, some member of the design team. We went through the process and we got buy-in from everybody and I think at the end of the, end of the project, the sceptics, which actually included me at one point, um, converted to, to the use of this, this BIM. So construction started in 2012, about a two-year programme, which is quite aggressive for this scheme. So let's say it's 19 storeys in the end, actually we actually went back into planning for another two storeys at the end as well. So 19 floor, floors developed in just over two years. Uh, Mace were appointed to do the project. It was very much BIM on a handshake. There was no real contract um, terms and conditions around BIM. It was very much used as a sort of a, a, an additional tool. To work, to, uh, to work with to ensure this, this scheme worked well. So we started quite late, stage D, or just started stage D. There was lots of things, there was planning and, and all sorts going on at the same time, but we, we got through it and uh, it worked pretty well. So just as far as team, um, on Blackfriars, the team was already in place. Um, and whilst the knowledge and, and, and understanding of BIM is important. I don't, it shouldn't be a, a key criteria in the selection of that team. If you've got a good, good team on board, they should be able to work within the BIM environment. Um, it may take time, but the, the, the right design is more important than the, the, sorry, the right design is as important as, the, as, as BIM. It should be a, BIM should be a further tool to be exploited to help that design, not to, uh, not, not to, um, to guide, to lead it. Um, so on 240 Blackfires, uh, so the team was, was already on, they have got ideally suited and they, they had the, the, the attributes to be able to, to adapt to BIM. So just to touch on the team quickly, the tent names you may or may not know, Alfred Hall, Morris, Moynihan Morris, the architects, AKT2 Structures and Hilson Moran, um, the key design members. Um, to smooth the sort of BIM process, we brought on a third party, we brought in um, a BIM coordinator uh, and they sort of sat with the design team as an external party to, to pull together the model and to flash up the, the clash detection. The architect maintained the role as lead coordinator and the BIM model was used as an aid for the coordination process uh, and not as a sole tool. Throughout the procurement processes, the sort of one of the key um, considerations was how we take this BIM model forward. We, we did the design <coughs> stage to say it's very much one step at a time on Blackfires Road. But we were quite interested on in how the main contractor would then feed into this process and also the subcontractors in the, the tier two. Um, and we found it was quite easy for people to float ideas around about BIM at that stage. Um, and we ended up with MACE and they fully embraced this BIM model. Um, and so we then sort of took it forward to work as a construction tool after the design. And this was one of the key sort of areas we focused on in, in using BIM with MACE. Um, all this construction work, this is, this is actually level 19, so it's about 90 storeys up in the, in, the, in the air. You can see a lot of two photos at the top of the building. Um, the structural engineer believes he saved three months on design by using BIM. I'm not quite sure about it, I think he's probably a bit over optimistic on that, but it certainly saves a significant amount of time on BIM. So this was used literally in the site office. The guys, uh, this was obviously the end product of quite a, a long process, um, and the guys were working out the package managers on the ground working out how the, uh, the roof would be constructed. Flat up a few issues. Unfortunately, it wasn't the, uh, the panacea. There were, there were some issues um, that sort of flushed out later when some of the, the, uh, the elements weren't modelled, and that caused a few issues on, on site. But again, we're pretty sure this, this, this saved significant time on site. Unfortunately, you can't really put a, a time against it. Um, but, you know, it, the fact that someone was sitting there two or three months before this even happened, rehearsing this, um, we believe through dividends. And also, um, 
helps from a health and safety perspective as well. And then the next project I'll touch on is Hanover Square, touched on earlier. Um, another sort of fairly old scheme actually was designed back in 2008. Um, we're looking at the moment, working with Crossrail, as I said earlier on, on, on an exercise where the, the two construction sites, you've got Crossrail developing the station beneath, sort of level, down to level minus five, and also constructing up to level one um, on, on our development. And then we uh, construct above, and also there's buildings around their site. Uh, and at the moment, there's a handover date uh, in 2000, the end of 2016, which we're actually, by using a 4D model, we're trying to bring that date forward by, by, by a year, by demonstrating to Crossrail and other key stakeholders that the two sites can be constructed together safely. This is a sort of overview of the site and aerial photos so of the sort of illuminated areas there of the site at the moment, as far as cross, the Crossrail site. And then 60% sort of, of the buildings around there uh, have demolished and redeveloped by us, as well as the, what we call the overstation development or the OSD, which will, will be a, a seven story building over the top of the, the, um, the Crossrail site. So, this is, uh, these are the following slides are sort of extracts from a, a model we put together to present to Crossrail to, to help convince them and to work with them to, to deliver the station. The whole, the whole point behind this is we don't want to be delivering um, an office, a commercial, major commercial block, block uh, development over the top of the Crossrail station, which is opening before we finish. Both, obviously, <coughs> both uh, Crossrail are now interests. So, this is two. Um, 4D timelines really. The one on the left is based on the current access date the Crossrail give us. The one on the right is based on um, a fairly aggressive programme which we're trying to pull forward say, to hopefully save or bring forward the programme by, by a year to then deliver our overstation development and Crossrail station box at the same time. This animation just sort of shows the early um, logistics. So let's say the slide on the, or the film on the, the left, which is nothing happening is where we sit at the moment. So sort of September next year, that site will still be sitting empty, although Crossrail will be constructing what we call the vent shaft, which is that green um, thing that's just come out of the ground there. And then they, they construct up to the first floor slab. So on the left hand side, Crossrail are getting on with their project. On the right hand side, oh, sorry, not, and we're not doing anything. On the right hand side is where we want to be with Crossrail, where they, they're continuing their construction. We're demolishing the rear buildings to the uh, to New Bond Street and also um, some of the, the, the buildings to the left there, it's quite difficult to explain without a pointer. Um, so then this jumps forward to seven months uh, where um, to the left again, Crossrail will finish the first floor slab and the building sitting there stagnant. There's no, there's no demo demolition works going on, Bills on the right, we're sort of demonstrating that you know, we, we can construct whilst they're still finishing off the basement works from their compound on Hanover Square. It's all our activities are coming from the other side. And then we jump through, um, it's quite powerful this slide, it sort of shows a sort of before and after as far as, this would be our access date based around the, the, uh, the Greenwood Cross route at the moment where we can finally start the site, whereas to the right, you know, we're a year or more into the programme already. And then it shows the sort of end, end situation where the station opens. Um, in December 18, with the, with the, with the cross rail is, uh, is delivered. Um, we're still on the left hand side, but it's not overly obvious. There's still elements of construction works going on around the station entrance where the green, Sorry, green arrows are, so which is obviously not really yeah, an ideal uh, situation. I would have thought that one of the primary things that should start, you should start looking at at very early stages is that uh, building of those uh, valued social roles. So, in a second. <laughs> so I, wasn't, I didn't hear that, sorry. So, the cost of BIM. Um, we've looked at this again, obviously, the question's raised, what, why invest in BIM? Um, is it worth the investment? Very simply, we think from a cost perspective, uh, we believe that BIM more than sort of washes its face. Uh, cost of incorporating a model is around about we estimate about half a percent of the construction value. Uh, from experience on projects to date, that's more than double as far as the saving we believe in risk. And then that's not taking into account the saving on the programme potentially. The 
And then from a sustainability perspective, um, as with any developer, we've got quite high uh, sustainability targets. Um, reduction in construction waste, I'm not sure if you can see it on this slide here, but we're sort of through, through using the BIM model and through efficiencies in design and, and construction. It can only help with, with reducing construction waste. Story of progress. And I'm very struck by uh, the point about reconfiguring the organisation. Some interference. Maybe it's one of the things that come on to Okay, the benefits of BIM. Um, it's become central to, to our design, construction, production, and, and production process in all our projects. It's resulted in the reduction in, in project risk. Uh, it's a central tool to robust um, high quality development. Why and undoubtedly, we, we incre resulting in increased collaboration. Something I've really touched on, really. I think from the sessions we've had working with BIM, um, we with the, the design team working around the table with the BIM coordinator, and then the contractor coming on board at a later date, sort of improves communication uh, between the team. And then the last sort of item we're looking at is obviously the, the, the facilities management side of things. And so we're quite early in our, in our um, investigations into this. Um, proving probably the most challenging. I think there's quite a lot of scepticism in the, the FM market, I'm not sure I should say that, but uh, we, we certainly see that and we're working through that one of our projects at the moment. So what next? Um, and what have we learned from 240 Blackfriars? I think we need a clear strategy. Uh, Blackfriars, as I said, was very much done on a handshake, um, which actually probably made it easier in some respects. As far as there's quite a lot of um, contractual um, confusion around the, been processed at the moment. Choose my words carefully there. Uh, and future schemes, I think we, we incorporated it early in the design process. It's probably end of stage C, but we would set the, the set the, uh, the strategy from the outset rather than let's say on BIM on the flat fires. It's <coughs> quite far into the process. Construction logistics again, also from early stage on Hanover Square. Those, those are obviously quite early and sort of quite low quality BIM, BIM images there. Um, but you know we. We would want to develop that further on our future schemes. And again, we haven't progressed very far down the road on, on the FM side of things yet. And the overarching thing with BIM, I think, is it's got to bring a higher quality design. It must bring efficiencies in construction. And again, it must bring um, efficiencies in the, uh, the management of that project, which must bring a, a better investment to, to have. And that's it from me. Thank you.